So the podcast that is up and running as we speak is an interview with Dr. Stephanie Green. She has written a book, This is Assisted Dying, a doctor's story of empowering patients at the end of life. She was one of the first people to administer medical assistance in dying in this country after the laws changed. So we thought you've heard Stephanie now. We're going to uh, rekindle a conversation with Ron Posno. You've heard him on the podcast before. Ron has dementia, formerly assessed with minor cognitive impairment in 2016. Ron's background, just for those of you uh, who might not remember, a test pilot, a school superintendent, a skier. He is most proud of teaching children with special needs and winning a national award for his curriculum innovation. He's a great guy who has been fighting for medical assistance in dying and for changes in the law. Ron, it's great to see you. How are you doing? I'm all right. I turned 82 this year, so I'm well launched in my 83rd year. Bound to make the best of it I can. Yes, you are making the best of it. You told me uh, just moments ago that uh, a friend of yours had actually um, undergone MAID today, somebody that you know. Can you yes. just talk about that experience from... Your well, yeah, she she chose, she and her husband chose 10 o'clock this morning, our time, here in London. Uh, this is a friend and a colleague that I've known for maybe 50 years. And uh, she's a well-respected woman. She, uh, she ran a business uh, center here as part of uh, the University of Western Ontario. That's how I first met her in her professional capacity. As it turned out, she was neighbors of, a, of a fr friends of ours. So yeah. we just extended it. Anyway, this, this lady contracted ALS a few years ago. And uh, um, <laughs> she, I, through the same mutual friend, I offered to talk with them if they chose to, because I don't push this. On no, anybody. No, so but I'm talking about me. Well, her husband came to me and said, We're ready. What what can you tell? So we talked about it. Um, and here it is, three months later, she's chosen to go. Yeah. And she was happy to go. I have never met anyone yet who's taken maids, and I I can't tell you the number of people. For, for whom I've been part of that process that admitted any kind of hurt or fear about MAID. Quite the relief, opposite. They were just, they were so pleased that they had access to MAID. That's what Stephanie said in her book, that even the families who might have been a bit reluctant at the beginning, because nobody wants to lose a loved one, understood when they watched their loved one um, to find that moment of peace. Exactly. I, 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 there have been, <laughs> I just kind of get up with this morning, there are four women this year who chose made that I know of. Yeah. And uh, they're all close people. And uh, what it's meant for their family to be able to have their mom or their sister have access to this was just, just a wonderful thing. I was and one of the things I want to make clear, I, because I, I, it ties right into this advance, uh, I prefer to call it advanced consent. Yeah. Advanced request, whatever, advanced request whatever the law record, people end yeah. up with, I, as long as they end up with a good version of it all. But um, the, the, the mere fact, and I'm thinking me particularly, um, but I've since found out other people feel the same way, that once you know you've got access to MAID, it brings a tremendous sense of relief. You just feel better right away. You don't, don't need to, you, don't, you don't need, it cuts out all that worry factor. Yeah. Because uh, most of us, worry about not just ourselves, but particularly the people we care about, if we know. And uh, to go through a period of time where you're 
or your death is protracted with pain and, and problems of the people trying to look after you and protect you and so on. But to find out you've got made just relieves you. I can focus now. Yeah, and my- I think that's what a lot of her stories were about, which was people also didn't want to be a burden to their loved ones when they themselves weren't going to be experiencing any quality of life. It's not like they wanted made because they just didn't want to be a, a problem. It's that it didn't it didn't serve anyone. That's right. Oh, exactly. And as I say, it's, you, I, I, it's difficult for me, and I'm a man of words, to be able to describe the kind of relief that it's brought. Yeah. And the opportunity now at my stage in my life uh, to realize that I can access made and I can focus on making today the best day possible. Every morning when I wake up and I have my wife beside me, I, I wake up, check the sun's up, I get up, and then I ask Sandy, what's up? <laughs> so yeah. we go home having a good day. And she's been there with you and, and agrees 100% with your your work on this and your dedication to this. Oh, yes. And she, she's there. I don't know. Wouldn't, it's, happy's not quite the word, but yeah. she's very pleased to be part of the yeah. process. Yeah. We spent uh, yesterday, late yesterday afternoon and evening with a couple. He, is, he has dementia, um, a former university professor mm-hmm. and uh, so well educated with knowing and he's quite well accepted his own problem and his wife's a wonderful person but the, the, we we're meeting with both of them and one of their two daughters their daughter uh, will be in her 40s now yeah. I guess and, and works in the up where you are and uh, so we're just talking about made and how you access it and what it can mean and so on. And it was, a, as you can imagine, a, a relatively mature thing. We had a lot of laughs together. Yeah. But here was daughter being reassured by mom and dad that this was the way to go, the yeah. way they want to go. And hearing that conversation, because that's the thing, you kind of need to bring your family and loved ones along with you. You, the, the person themselves probably comes to the decision a lot quicker and a lot easier than the family members. Well, of course, and the, the law says it. The yeah. law, as you know, is all kinds of failings, but the, the thing is, made isn't anything unless the person who needs it requests it, really wants yeah. it. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's where it has to be. So where what is your own situation now, Ron? You were first diagnosed in August of 2016. It's 2022. You're still sitting here having a very rational, competent conversation um, with us. So where do you stand in terms of um, your own desire for MAID? Well, it uh, hasn't diminished at all. I, I was fortunate that uh, in my quest for MAID, which began oh, within a year of my diagnosis, I, I was uh, aware of MAID before then. It was more yeah. of intellectual awareness. When the law was passed, uh, I said, hooray, because I, I, I always felt badly about Sue Rodriguez back in the early 90s, who couldn't get it. Yeah. So in here it was Kay Carter, and she and the lawyers, particularly the lawyers, all worked with the Supreme Court and unanimously. They said people should not have to die in agony when they do not want to be. Yeah. So Kay Carter had her release. Now she couldn't get released through a Canadian thing. She had to go to she had to go overseas to get help. But it right. turned out, but the court did order help for her, and then gave the government direction to change the law. Well, unfortunately, in that process, the law that was derived by your colleagues uh, there in 2016 came very short. In the was this is my opinion, and the opinion shared by many people. And certainly, Stephanie said that that the court had given 
people much room to move, the politicians of the day, and, and they they chose to circumscribe it and make it tougher and narrower instead of um, as expansive as the court had suggested. Well, exactly. It, when it was passed in June 2016, the law was passed. Yeah. And the law, if administered as it was passed, would still deny K. Rodriguez or K. Uh, Carter Mark, yeah. and Sue Rodriguez uh, access to me through because they had a lot. But the point is, where, where am I? Yeah. Well, I, I got, as you know, I got involved and I got on CBC radio and your colleague, Michael Enright, did a wonderful job in his interview with me that day. But I couldn't get access to a physician to do this because the law would not permit it. So this is the still point, and I just, I just want to explain for people who um, who may not be up to speed on this. The, the question is, can those with dementia or Alzheimer's make an advance request and say, look, I know that I'm going to lose my faculties, and I want to tell you ahead of time that in the following circumstances, I would like to opt for MAID. And Every the the governments are still resisting that, and it's a very complicated situation. And the doctors differ. I mean, Stephanie and other doctors suggest that there are some circumstances in which somebody in your case could access made, but it's not clear. It's not clear. It's not definite. Uh, one of the uh, legal advisors to Dying with Dignity, she talks about it being a two-track system. There is an opening available today for people with dementia, but you have to be very knowledgeable and you have to have physicians, doctors, aid providers who are cognizant of and will be willing to work with you over a period of time. And most of the people who administer MAID feel very uncomfortable about suggesting anything more than six months from now. Well, yeah. here I am at this stage in my life. I'm not looking at six months. I'm looking three, four, or five years down the road. Yeah. Fortunately, my decline is very slow. Yeah. But that's not the case with everybody with dementia. Like I'll take a known case. Uh, again, one of your colleagues, Lisa Rake. Mm -hmm. she, uh, <laughs> she married late in her life. As it turned out, just after she was married, late or early fifties of age, her husband was diagnosed, and he was he's he's uh, early, early onset. Early onset. Yeah. Well, with that early onset came a lot of things very early, and within two or three years, he became very paranoid and hallucinogenic and was prepared to beat up. Well, of course, they had to separate. They had, but they couldn't access MAID. Yeah. They couldn't oh, access she is, He has had to go into a facility where he can be managed. And then this is the catch-22, which is that at this point now, he's not considered competent to actually give that final approval and say, yes, I, I told you I wanted this. I We put in the request. We did all this. But in the final moments, he, he can't actually say yes or no. He's not considered competent. And that's the major shortfall of law. And even with this two-track system, we have that block right there. And, and uh, what we need is this advanced consent or request, yeah. where here I am, I think reasonably competent at this stage of my life, I want made. I want to be able to ask for it. I'll follow the process. And people can understand all that. But I don't want made this year. I want made down the road. And I've specified very, after a great deal of thought, eight very specific conditions that may have, I don't have any guarantee. I know I'm declining, but if any of these conditions occur, then that's what I want to have made. But Things I can't like I it. can't I look can't after myself. I that final record. Yeah. I can't, Rick, I don't recognize my family. Uh, just, Things that to you constitute quality of life. Oh, yeah. Well, you see, I 
right? I'm trying to explain to people <laughs> with dementia, you, you're, gonna, you're living, but your living, your ability to live declines. Yeah. Not straight down, not even a bounces around, but it declines. There's no recovery from this. We do not have a means of recovery. Now, we don't know <coughs> in which direction, but your life is leaving you. And you don't necessarily decline in the same way that you acquired your living skills. So you reach a point where living becomes existence, yeah. not life. My life, your life, most people in their life, they depend on being able to do things, make decisions about their life, be able to help the people around them, participate in life. That's living. But when you just become an existent something, like a slug, that's not living. My apologies for the coughing, Ron, but it seems like such a reasonable list to be able to say, I know that eventually uh, the dementia will take my ability to make these decisions. So I want to spell it out for you so that as doctors, you know, as family, you know, Sandy, your wife knows. Um, and we're trying to make some progress on that, but we can't seem to get our committee restarted to uh, to really take this issue on and wrestle the hard, difficult stuff about advanced consent, advanced yeah. requests. But that's really the nub of it. It's where we are all at yeah. now. Yeah, it's a, it's a hang up on this final list confirmation. Yeah. And my list, other people have similar kinds of lists. They, uh, these lists are prepared by, by the person themselves. Yeah. While they're capable of conscious. So it's just to provide guidance to the physician and to the family that, hey, this, this is the time when I would like to go. Well, we're going to keep working on it. I was just going to read the opening, uh, the prologue in, in Stephanie's book, and she just puts it this way. What if you could decide at the end of your life exactly when and where your death would happen? What if instead of dying alone in the middle of the night or in a hospital bed, you could be at home with the time at a time of your choosing? You could decide who would be with you in the room and a doctor could help ensure that your death was comfortable and peaceful and dignified. What if you could plan a final conversation with everyone you love? None of us would ever look at death the same way again. Absolutely. Because I'm, I'm working on another thing with, with the maid in, in, let's say, in suspension right now Yeah. because of work you've got to do. I've been working with the uh, Alzheimer's group, particularly. Yeah. I'm trying to deal with uh, these end of life things. And that question you, that Stephanie put forward is very much part of what I'm working with with a lot of people. If you had your choice, where would you like to die? And when would you like to die? Now, uh, <laughs> Peter Mansbridge ran a panel there of an mm -hmm. hour with a renowned doctor, Samir Sinal, and uh, oh, there was another lady, I don't, can't remember what she did, but then there was uh, Wanda Tamblin, she's head of CanAge. But they had statistics that showed that 97% of the people in Canada, aged people, want to die at home. 97%. And when do you want to die? Well, what they'd like to do is go to bed at night and not wake up in the morning. Thank you very much. Well, it fits right in with what Stephanie's talking about, and certainly I'm talking about. If you could plan it, work it out, you could go in a very easy, dignified, and in a fashion. When I'm thinking of the, the four people that I know with ALS, the past year who've chosen me. They all had this chance to be with family and chosen friends, but they could do it even over time. It didn't all have to be done at the same day. 
So it was wonderful. But the numbers really do. And I think that's what's so surprising is that the Canadian public is ready to embrace this. Their acceptance is way ahead of the politicians. Well, they all do. You know, <laughs> I think when the, when when uh, made was originally considered, they uh, so many of of the people that are opposing it talk about the so-called slippery slope. Yeah, you don't want to make it easy for people to die because <laughs> thousands, millions of people are going to choose that easy way and slip down the slope and go. Well, we, if you know, we've got the facts very clear. There are very few that have the chance. They're glad to have the chance, but we have long way from a slippery slope. And yeah. I'm just looking at what's happened in Canada's numbers, but take a look at where we've had this for, in, for more than 20 years in yeah. Netherlands yeah. and Belgium. They didn't have a slippery slope either. No, that's what the numbers mean. Ron, we're starting to get some horns honking here. Oh, is that what that is? So that's oh. what that is. <laughs> so we'll bring this to a to a close. But thank you so much. Um, great to catch up with you, and great to see you in such fine form and still ready to do battle on this. I'm with you, Pam, <laughs> all the way. All right, <laughs> we'll talk soon. Thanks so much. Okay, right, Pam. Bye now. Bye bye, Ron Cosno an advocate for medical assistance in dying. He'll be with us again on this show, I know, many times. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining us.